Hi, everyone. Let's see. Can you hear me yet? How about that? Is that good? Not too overwhelming, not too ear bleeding, because I can turn it up. Because that way you won't actually have to hear what I'm saying. So therefore, it'd probably go better, let's be honest. Some, several of you heard me talk before, so uh, it'd probably be better. Uh, thank you guys for all coming out. I really appreciate that. Um, they sold through all of my new book already, so. I mean, they, they only brought one copy over, let's be honest, but um, no, they had two. So if anybody wants to buy it, um, I actually have a code I think I can send out that my publisher sent me that's like 20% off, uh, buying it through their website. Uh, so it wouldn't have worked tonight. So I'm so, everyone's like, I see Christy back there. She's like, where's my 20% my here? So, uh, so but thank you guys all very much for that. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, there's other stuff out there, obviously. Uh, if any of you need more lack accoutrements or books or whatever. Uh, the shirts, Austin and I are trying to get rid of those because uh, they've been selling too fast uh, and they've been burning our hands from all the selling so we're trying to just sell those so those are those are five bucks if you want one of those ten bucks or ten bucks what did I charge you Keita? Ten. 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 We'll say ten then uh, or otherwise <laughs> I charge special people more so uh, it's, it's, I just I look at your bank account right quick, and then I'm like, how much are they? Okay, yeah, it's 35 for you. So, uh, but yeah, thank you guys all for coming out, uh, support the release of my new book, uh, which I'm very excited about, and we worked really hard on, and I think it turned out well. Um, you can let me know, of course, uh, or not, depending on what your opinion is. So, uh, either way, I'll assume that you liked it. So. What I was going to do today uh, is just give kind of a short talk about the subtitle of our book, which is Why You Can't Trust Your Brain. Um, because it turns out that very, very often our brains, like poor Deadpools here, uh, fail us. Uh, now, they're great. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, the brain is an amazing, amazing organ that does these extraordinary complex things very easily. Uh, but it's also pretty easily fooled. And that's one of the reasons why our book is titled Critical Thinking, Science and Pseudoscience is because it's very, very easy, it turns out, to believe things without actually having good evidence for them. Uh, and if you doubt that, just you know, look to your children and Santa Claus and the fact that you know, their parents love them and things like that. Uh, I mean, is there, is there evidence for that? Uh, uh, I mean, I hope mom, dad, I hope maybe a little we'll, bit. We'll but. Our okay, good, good, good. We, we already sold the books, so that's good. <laughs> Might have put a dent in the sales there. So, um, But before, before I get started talking about really why you can't trust your brain, I just wanted to give some acknowledgments. Um, first, to my co author, Jacques Rousseau, uh, who's a philosopher at the University of Cape Town. Um, without him, it would have taken me probably twice as long to write this and it would have only been about half as good, uh, but maybe twice as funny, because I would have written more of it, but not that Jacques's not funny, but I mean, I'm, I'm pretty funny, so. Um, just like that, see, that was, that was a funny thing. Okay, next one. Uh, I wanted to thank my lovely wife, Allison, uh, and her long-suffering self. Uh, she put up with lots of me going, but I just, I just have to finish this part. I have to finish this part and me staying up very late writing and doing things like that, uh, which led to her beating me severely multiple times, but I'm tough, and I'm tougher now, so uh, that helps. That's, that's, that's right, that's why I had to have that surgery in November, so. Um, and then Signe, Jock's wife, also put up with his nonsense, so that's awesome. Uh, our editors at Springer, Nancy and uh, Amanda, were great and very helpful and definitely made the book better. Uh, as did Sharon and Matt Madison, and Sharon's actually here today over here taking pictures because she likes to hide behind the camera, but 
uh, <laughs> and uh, she and her husband Matt uh, read through the entire book as we were writing it and gave us uh, proofreading comments and content comments and really contributed to the book being much better overall. So, so thank all of those folks. So, uh, with that being said, how many of you guys have a brain tonight? Is that everyone brought theirs? No one left it at home. Good. Good. Some people are a little iffy. Uh, like, I brought half of one, right? Like the right half. I left the left half. No. Uh, <laughs> some of you are like, eh, maybe a quarter. Uh, depends on what you've been doing beforehand, I suppose. Uh, and afterwards as well. We'll see. Uh, but the human brain is an amazing, amazingly complex organ. Uh, our best current estimates is it has somewhere like 86 billion neurons in it, which altogether form over 100 trillion different connections via these, these synapses. Uh, that's a lot. That's a pretty big number. I don't know if you guys are familiar with big numbers, but that's a pretty big number. Um, so this is pretty complex, pretty amazing, but unfortunately that doesn't stop us from being fooled by it. Uh, and often what fools our brain is actually our brain, which seems a little problematic. But as we'll see, there's some good reasons for that. Um, it's been very useful in some ways, but in many ways, uh, our brain fools itself, thankfully, in predictable ways. Uh, and we can kind of skirt around or edge around those. So um, Many of you doubt people, right? You doubt people pretty frequently. Uh, whether it's the person trying to sell you a car uh, or your, you know, let's say friend saying that, you know, you do look good in those jeans or whatever it is. Uh, many of us doubt other people, right? Which is great. It turns out doubting is a very good thing to do. Um, but doubting yourself is something that a lot of us do not do. And being able to doubt your own self so not just you know, cast judgment on other people, but actually take a look at yourself and say, eh, how is this? How is this going? Um, is very, very difficult, but it truly is the hallmark of an enlightened mind. Someone who can doubt themselves effectively shows that, look, I can take what I believe, whatever it happens to be, and I can see, eh, well, is that true, though? Is there good evidence to support that? rather than just blindly accepting your own beliefs. And so doubting yourself really is the key to being a good critical thinker and good what we would call a scientific skeptic, which I just shorthand skeptic here. But like I said, it's really, really hard to do. You know, most of us are not taught to doubt ourselves. We're taught to doubt other people, right? And we're taught to cast judgment on other people and be like, eh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. But doubting ourselves is hard and something we're not taught to do, but it's really that when you start doing that, that's when you become a truly a critical thinker. Because you're not just applying those critical thinking tools to other people, but actually to your own self. And the reason that you have to doubt yourself is because of what I call the logically illogical brain. Which sounds like a bit of a misnomer, right? It's logical, but it's illogical. And what I mean by this is that we often think or act in a very understandable and predictable way that is nonetheless fairly irrational. So it's illogical the way that we often process information, but it's logical in the way that, well, we can predict it. Like I can predict when you're gonna be doing these kinds of uh, confirmation biases and mental heuristics like we'll see in a little bit. And I'm not just meaning like me specifically, I'm meaning anybody can do this with anybody else. And so knowing the ways that our brain fools itself and the ways that we can actually maybe make better decisions is key to getting and becoming a critical thinker. Being able to say, here's what I know, here's what I don't know, here's what I know with this particular amount of certainty, um, but not necessarily, here's everything, right? You don't have to know everything, but being able to see, here's how I do and do not know things. Um, the two biggest factors that we see in what this logical, illogic, sort of uh, brain is what we call cognitive biases and then mental heuristics, which as we see will actually, you know, a lot of terms give rise to various kinds of cognitive biases. Now there's a whole lot of these, a whole, whole lot. Um, and the book chapter on this covers most of these. 
Uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. But when we talk about cognitive biases, what we mean is that there are very predictable patterns of ways that we make judgments that maybe are not exactly uh, reasonable, logical, rational. And so what these then do, these cognitive biases, is they cause us to misinterpret information around us. They cause us to have an inaccurate understanding of information that we're processing, things that are coming into us. And this, in turn, makes our brain regularly misinterpret evidence. And this is you know, a pretty well-known, well-understood field. We've had a lot of research on this in the last particularly 40 years or so. Um, and so we have a, a pretty good idea of how most of these things work. Now, mental heuristics, on the other hand, all right, so those are cognitive biases. Mental heuristics, uh, these are basically shortcuts, all right, mental shortcuts, mental rules of thumb, if you will. And what these do is these actually decrease the effort required to solve problems, to make decisions. Um, and a lot of times these can be really, really useful, really helpful, and allow us to save a lot of cognitive effort when we're trying to make a decision. But much like with the biases, these tend to lead to an oversimplification of reality. So if I you know, just say, OK, well, what direction is Texas from here? South, but also west, <laughs> right? But everyone's like, oh, south, south. Well, but then you just missed a huge chunk of Texas, right? Um, so that's a, I mean, we're, no one's missing it, let's be honest. Um, you know, no, one's, no one's upset about that. But uh, you left out a large chunk of Texas. Uh, sorry, Texans, if there's, is there anyone from Texas here? Yes. Oh, that's right, Austin. So Texas Tech, yeah, well, we're still sorry. Um, so these really oversimplify reality, right? They, they cause us to have these errors in judgment. And a lot of times these errors then give rise to the various cognitive biases that we're really going to focus on uh, in this talk. Now, saying this, uh, all cognitive biases are not bad. All right? Cognitive biases in general are not necessarily all the time bad because a lot of times they are useful in making decisions where we don't have much time, where we just have to have a good enough rather than a perfect decision, uh, where we're just concerned with our immediate vicinity rather than you know, the whole of the world or the universe. Um, so these can often be useful, can be good, and can have a positive effect in decision making. But we have to know kind of when is it that we have these biases pop up that make us have problems in judgment, have problems in decision making. And like I said, there's a whole ton of these. There's tons and tons of these biases and heuristics. We're going to talk about two tonight specifically and then see some examples of those. Uh, the first one's called the confirmation bias. The second one's called uh, belief perseverance. Uh, and then there's other big ones that we often see, which I'm not going to cover, but you know, certainly in the book. Or, I'll talk to you about them later if you want. Uh, the representative heuristic, the availability heuristic, all sorts of mental shortcuts that we make. All right. So let's talk about the confirmation bias. All right. um, this is where individuals uh, will take information that they're being presented with, and they do one of two things when this information comes in. Um, they tend to confirm their beliefs that they already hold if the evidence matches with those, or they tend to discount information that does not match with their already held beliefs. And so we have new information. Let's say, um, let's say that I'm reading a journal article, or you're reading an article in the newspaper, uh, you're hearing somebody talk on the radio, and you hear some new information come in. You're going to do one of two things. If it confirms what you already believe, right? So it already matches up with what you believe. So if I hear on the radio that, um, you know, Oklahomans are super nice people, right? I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, they are super nice people. I mean, not all of them. You know, many of you here tonight, probably not, but, um, but most of them, right? In general, lots of Oklahomans are very nice, particularly on an individual level. And so if that matched what I already believe, uh, I would just sort of, yeah, of course, of course, duh. Right? Like, I, I, 
Of course they do. Why would I even doubt that? And we're happy to have been shown it. Like, oh, I'm glad. I heard that, I heard that coming on the radio today. Oklahoma's very friendly. And then my wife's like, oh, of course they are. Even though she's from Arkansas, we've adopted her as an Oklahoma. So. Right? Um, and then the other thing that we do with information that already confirms what we believe is that we forgive any inconsistencies, any problems. We forget those things. So we forgive and we forget because it matches with what I believe. So if I'm reading a journal article, for example, that says that you know, um, the type of treatment that I specialize in for OCD uh, works really, really well, I'll be like, yeah, duh. We already knew that, of course, because that's what I do. Even if there were massive problems in, say, the statistical analyses or in how the study was set up, I would just be like, oh, let's just kind of gloss over that and forget that. But even though we forget things, we're still more likely to recall the information as it presenting or supporting our argument later. So if someone is like, well, no, Texans are really nice. I'd be like, look, I heard on the radio, Oklahomans are actually the nicest. And they'll be like, well, but they only surveyed Oklahomans for that. And you'd be like, I don't remember that part. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so this is when we already believe the thing that we're hearing, right? When we do not agree with that information, when we do not believe what it is that we're being told, we do very different things. First off, we immediately discount it. That's bullshit, right? <laughs> That's our first sort of like, nope. Doesn't agree with me, nope, right? Doesn't matter what it is, that's our first natural response, all right? So we immediately discount it, and then we begin to pick it apart. We just pick it apart. Oh, well, no, I mean, this sample is all wrong, and, and look at the people that you talked to, and this writing is terrible, look at the journal it was published in, or look at the paper it was published in, look who was saying it. We start nitpicking it to death. Any potential flaws become these huge, fatal issues. And we actually forget it fairly quickly. Because it doesn't already confirm what we believe. It doesn't match with what it is that we believe. And so we just kind of let it go. We don't think about it much because we're just like, that's nonsense. Get it out of here. Right? And this confirmation bias, it turns out, doing this, you know, having this sort of thing occur, happens to all of us all the time. Most of us don't realize that it's happening at any given moment. And it greatly, greatly shapes the world that we live in, in terms of our perceptions of it. Right? It puts very different goggles on you for when you're looking around in the world. Because you're perceiving, responding to, remembering very different pieces of information than someone who holds a different belief than you do. And so this confirmation bias is one of the primary reasons why we needed to develop scientific methodology because we naturally try and confirm what it is that we believe. We naturally seek and pay attention to that confirming evidence. But what the scientific methodology makes us do is it makes us actually look for disconfirming evidence. You know, when I set up a study, for example, I don't set it up to try and support my hypothesis. I set it up to try and disprove my hypothesis. Because it'd be really easy to game the system to try and support what it is that I believe or how I want my study to turn out. But that's not really fair because we know how well that does not work. So the other thing about the confirmation bias, and this is really, really fun, is that the more emotionally charged an issue is or the more deeply you hold a belief, the stronger the confirmation bias gets. So let's, let's say that I think that, I don't know, Fords are better than Chevy pickups, right? But I'm just like, meh, yeah, it's because I can have a Ford. And I hear another study on the radio come out that's like, no, we conclusively proved that Chevys are better than Fords. I'd be like, well, I don't really care too much about it, so. All right. But like, let's say that I was, I was like a major stock owner in Ford, which I'm not. You know, I own a 94 F-150 worth approximately $17. <laughs> uh, and that's after the $1,000 that I put into it, you know, to fix things. Uh, but if I was a major stock owner in Ford and I heard that, 
I would just be, no, right? My confirmation bias would become very, very strong, very active, and I would just be very against whatever it was that's against my beliefs. And this has a lot of impact on the real world and a lot of very contentious issues in American society. They're very emotionally charged, they're very strongly held, and so when you have confirmation biases at play, they become very, very prominent and very strong. So the second kind of cognitive bias that I want to chat about for just a couple minutes is what we call belief perseverance. And this is the simple fact that we naturally, as humans, have a tendency to stick with whatever we are happening to believe at a particular point in time. Even if we have contradictory or disconfirming evidence for that shown to us. We still want to stick to it, we still want to stay with it, and we just, it's hard to get us out of that rut. Right? It's hard to change beliefs, it turns out. This is why, for example, arguing with people on the internet doesn't tend to work. I don't know if any of you have experienced this or argued with people on the internet before. Damien. But, uh, but it doesn't tend to change beliefs because people tend to stick with those, right? They tend to stick with that. Here's what I believe, this is what I'm saying. I'm going to stay here. And it takes generally a lot of time and a lot of effort to get someone to change a belief, even on something fairly minor. Right? If it's already believed, people stick with it. There's sort of three main ways that this um, stays, or kinds of belief perseverance, so ways that this stays. Um, what we call self-impressions, social impressions, naive theories. Self-impressions are beliefs about yourself, right? So, you know, how do I think I am in a particular session? So, um, let's say that I think I have a fantastic singing voice, right? <laughs> and other people are like, hmm, that is terrible. You know, people roll up the windows when they're next to me at stops, or you know, my wife blasts the radio whenever I start singing. I'm like, well, that's a funny coincidence. I guess you didn't hear me. Right. Um, but if I have a self-impression of, oh, I'm a good singer, it's going to take a lot to disconfirm that. right? Um, or that I'm good at something, or that I'm bad at something. We see that, for example, a lot of times in people who think that they're bad at math. I'm bad at math. Probably not. You probably just haven't really been shown effective ways of doing it. And so you keep that self-impression and it becomes sort of self-fulfilling. The social impressions are, you know, ideas about society or groups of people, however that happens to be. You know, if I think this group is a particular way and that group's a particular way, you know, Texans are terrible, you know, whatever it would happen to be. Not that all Texans are, just most of them. Um, not all of them, right? So, uh, my sister-in-law from Texas, lovely person. So, most people though. Mm -hmm. um, but we tend to stick with those beliefs, right? If I think a particular group of people are snotty or stupid or whatever it happens to be, we stick with that. And then the last sort of group of this is what we call naive theories. And these are just our understanding of how the world works uh, or how things in the world work. So. For example, uh, what direction does the sun rise? Anybody? Yes, you all said, it. most of you said the east, but you're wrong because the sun doesn't rise. It's stationary. Uh, it just, you know, it appears to rise from the east, right? But it doesn't. Like, it's the rotation of the earth that actually moves there. Um, and still, you know, some people are like, mm, nope, not going to happen. Right, what we call heliocentric uh, folks, right, or uh, geographically centric, uh, earthocentric. I'm not sure what the word is there. Geocentric. There we go. Thank you, Scott. Geocentric. Um, you know, it's hard for some people to take these naive theories about how the world is and seems to be, and then apply that. Um, so those are our three big kinds of belief perseverance that we see, and these stay believed for numerous reasons. Um, one is what we call illusory correlations, which is thinking there's a relationship between two things when there's not actually one. Right? Um, so I spill the salt, I throw some on my shoulder, and nothing bad happens. Right? And good, good. You know, I see a black cat, and I'm like, oh, shit, go the other way. 
Nothing bad happens. Whew. But then there is that one time I didn't. I was just like, sorry, cat. Um, maybe I ran over it. Maybe just got scared. I don't know. Who knows how that story went? I'm not going to say it. Uh, but I didn't. And then I got like a flat tire. Uh, and it's like, ah, I knew it. I knew I should have avoided that black cat. What I maybe didn't know was that, you know, I already had a nail in the tire. You know, not that the cat is like some sort of ninja that sliced my tire or something, right? I mean, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, but I thought there's a relationship between two things. There's not actually a relationship. The other reason is what we call distortions of evidence. And this goes back to that confirmation bias, all right? Because what we tend to do is we remember the hits and we forget the misses. Uh, so any of you who have ever seen uh, someone claim to be a psychic or a psychic medium who says that they talk to the dead, right? Uh, and that they get information from the dead. Uh, that is false. Good job, Colin. Uh, <laughs> I do this in, my, in some of my classes. I hold seances, uh, which becomes pretty entertaining at times. Uh, because I literally tell them up front that I've not got any psychic powers. And I'm just doing a trick. And then people will be like, Grandma! <laughs> I'm like, yes, I have your grandma right here. No, I just told you all ago I don't, right? Um, but I could say you know, 30 or 40 things. But they'll latch on to the one thing that I said that was real. And we see this in people like John Edward, or Von Prague, or Sylvia Brown, or uh, the new one, Tyler Henry, the Hollywood medium, right? Uh, what they do is they just throw all this information out, and people forget it because eventually something sticks, right? Like, I'm sensing, I'm sensing someone in here uh, lost a loved one to death. <laughs> <gasps> what? That's me. Did your loved one die because of death? <laughs> Did their name start with a letter of the alphabet? <laughs> right? Like, things like that. It's like, oh, they, it did. You know, I mean, Grandpa 012, his wouldn't, but, you know, Grandma, <laughs> Grandma K, hers did. Uh, and so you, you know, you think about that or you sort of pick up on those things, right? So we forget the things that don't confirm, again, what it is we already believe. We remember the things that do. Now, when you put these two things together, right, the confirmation bias, belief perseverance, um, you end up with a very interesting thing happening, which is our brain a lot of times makes something from literally nothing. So we see things, we hear things, uh, and I'm not talking about like a hallucination, schizophrenia sort of thing here, but seeing things, hearing things that are not actually there because that's what we expect to see. That's what we expect there to be. And so a lot of times what happens is people are primed, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, people are primed to see or hear certain things and then their confirmation bias really kicks into gear. And then once that kicks into gear, that belief perseverance takes over and the next thing you know, you think that, for example, the devil uh, is in your rock and roll music. So uh, that's an actual picture of the devil and his rock and roll music. So in case you didn't know, he frequently wears this t-shirt. So um, for those of you who are old enough to remember this or perhaps have, have seen these things on the interwebs, there was a huge uproar in the 70s and the 80s about supposedly satanic messages in rock music. Um, which, I mean, is hilarious because some of the, especially some of the bands of the, you know, uh, late 70s, early 80s were, were very openly like, we are, yes, we are Black Sabbath, right? Like, no, let's hide some things. You know, <laughs> like they're hiding stuff. It's like, they literally, they're called Black Sabbath. I mean, they're called Slayer, right? <laughs> There's an album titled South of Heaven. Like, they're not... They're not hiding these things, people, but a lot of folks thought that there were. Um, and supposedly, a lot of these were inserted via what's called backmasking. Backmasking. Now, backmasking is very interesting because supposedly what it is is someone would record a message, all right, uh, and then they would flip it backwards. <coughs> And you would hear that actual message being played backwards. 
but you would subconsciously <laughs> unwind it, and then it would influence you to do evil <laughs> or other various things. So let's take a look at some of the more famous ones. Um, so most of you are probably familiar with Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> That's played on classic rock stations literally thousands of times a day. I think the cat plays it approximately 12 billion times per day. Um, you know, very, very popular song played you know, billions of times across the, uh, the last 40 years or so. Um, here is what it supposedly uh, is backwards. Uh, so I'm just going to play it first so that you hear it. And then we'll look at what the actual lyrics uh, supposedly are for the backmasked lyrics. So, so prepare yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite as catchy backwards, right? Like, like no one's going around humming that one. Uh, so, so did anyone hear anything? Anyone hear any? What? What? Satan. Satan? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so here is again supposedly what it says. Oh, here's to my sweet Satan, the one whose little path would make me sad, whose power is Satan. Uh, apparently these don't have to make sense. Uh, he'll give those with him 666. There was a little tool shed where he made us suffer sad Satan. <laughs> now, now that you've seen those lyrics, I'm going to play it again and I want you to listen again, okay? I don't know about y'all, but I feel like uh, eating some babies. <laughs> Sorry, little ones. Um, now, how much of what was supposedly in this, that reversed passage did you hear on the first go-round? <laughs> you may have heard like one or two things, right? Probably Satan, because I had literally just said the devil's music, right? I know what you're talking about, the devil. Um, <laughs> But most of that, no. Like, who got tool shed? Anybody was like, I had, oh, first, first time I heard tool shed. I got that part. <laughs> you probably did, Matthew. Um, and there's, there's tons of these, supposedly. Um, any Eagles fans in here? Yeah. Now, notice these aren't like the entire song, right? Uh, but supposedly, let's, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what supposedly this says. You guys got that, right? I uh, did. Supposedly it's Satan, he hears this, he had me believe in him. Let's see. Again, delicious babies are on TV. Right? Um, and there's, there's tons and tons of these out there. But these are the sort of, of evidence that was presented by a number of like uh, mothers against rock and roll and groups like that. Uh, there were con literally congressional hearings about this in the early 80s because we didn't have anything else going on, <laughs> right? Um, wh what? No. Like everyone, just hearing that part, right, the forward, everyone was like... I have this uncontrollable desire to go and be evil, right? Like, uh, no. Like, how many times does Hotel California play on the radio, right? And we, every time it plays, we see this mass of, of murders. It's because people are tired of it is what it is, though. It's not because of, because of this. So 
so these, you know, supposed back mask uh, inserted music uh, is one example of what we're going to talk about. Um, many of you may have been familiar with this, the face of a Martian. Uh, in 76, the Viking 1, which was our first major uh, probe to Mars, started sending back images and NASA actually released uh, this image. This is the full image up here. And this is the inset of the image view in question. Uh, they released this image of what seemed to be like, a, it was about a two and a half kilometers long uh, face. The face on Mars. Uh, and, they, and NASA literally says, they're like, hey, look, this looks like a face. And then they showed actually why it wasn't a face. But then people are just like, holy shit, there's a face on Mars. <laughs> there are literally, apparently, giant Martians, right? And they're building these huge statues to themselves. Uh, and they wanted us to find those. And they look oddly like us, right? <laughs> Somewhat unlikely, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek notwithstanding, that they would look exactly like us. Um, and those are just two small examples. But this is what I call seeing because of believing, right? Seeing because of believing. So you already believe something, so therefore you start to see that or hear that. And our brain is amazingly good at misperceiving information in a way that matches up with our already established beliefs. And we call this pareidolia, right? pareidolia, which is kind of a fancy word. I can't spell it. So I have to spell check it every time I put it in here. Uh, but it's just our tendency to interpret something random or something ambiguous as having meaning, <laughs> as being something in particular. And we're really good at it. Um, so, for example, Let's say that I crack open a geode. What's that? Colin, who's that? You don't know? Who does it look like? Sesame Street. It's Cookie Monster. <laughs> we want Cookie, right? Like, Cookie Monster is in a freaking rock. Like, that's amazing. Like, this is actually the rock that Jim Henson saw where he got the inspiration for, I don't know if you guys knew that fact I just made up, but that is the fact that I just made up. Uh, but I mean, that's, it's a rock, like it's a rock formation, but it's also a cookie monster. Or maybe you can look at these boxes and see their stern disapproval of you and your entire life. Right, they're just boxes, but we're obviously we're like, oh no, those are angry eyebrows. They're like, mm, what's going on here? This is not good. But they're just boxes, right? It's just random stimuli that we are interpreting as being meaningful. If you like this sort of thing, there's a whole subreddit uh, devoted to this called R Pareidolia. It has some fantastic things, uh, very funny. Some I could not show <laughs> because of children uh, and university policy. Uh, but those are just two small, small examples of this. And one of the things that we tend to experience pareidolia for the most are human faces. Our brains are pattern recognition machines, particularly for faces. Uh, people who can't recognize faces respond appropriately to emotions and faces. We often label them as having various kinds of deficits or mental disorders, things like, for example, autism, schizophrenia large deficits in being able to recognize and express emotion. And so our brains are very, very good at that. They're also very good at religious imagery. And we can see this in uh, things like, oh, it's the Virgin Mary and a piece of toast. Like, probably not, though, right? I mean, <coughs> if the Virgin Mary is going to appear, it's probably not going to be on a piece of Wonder Bread that you half burned, right? I would think it would be a little more spectacular entrance, but maybe that's just me. Uh, but we are very, very primed a lot of times for human faces and for religious imagery. Um, and if our confirmation biases are very much in play, then all of a sudden we start seeing huge amounts of pareidolia pop up. And this is primarily for two reasons. One thing that we call priming, which we'll see in a second, and the other that we call patternicity. Um, so priming is simply uh, a form of memory that is implicit and non-conscious. I'm not thinking about it, all right? It just sort of happens. 
I'm not purposefully trying to remember something. I'm just, it turns out, uh, responding to a stimuli that I've already seen in some other context. And what this does is it can change your behavior slightly in other contexts where I either recognize it, I recall it, I otherwise pay attention to things that are similar to the thing that I've been primed with. Um, so, for example, uh, I have teaching assistants for various classes, and if I wanted them to really like one of my TAs and not like one of them, what I would do is I would insert very, very briefly in between each of my slides a picture of the TA's face that I wanted them to like. And even though they're being exposed to it very, very briefly, subconsciously, if I do that enough, they're going to start actually liking that one better. Uh, or if I put a picture up of me with like a lot of money or something students like, like a cell phone or something like that, right? And I have the pictures together and I'm like, look at your cell phone. Uh, over and over and over again, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I like that guy. I don't know what it is about him, but I, I like his style, which is black and gray. Right? Um, which is what it is. So, what is this? Everybody, everybody, so what is this? It's not, it's not a trick. This is not a trick. This is it. What, what is this? Uh, that's a woman. Thank you. That is a woman's face. That is a woman's face. Everyone's like, mm, I'm not sure about this. I'm not going to answer. I've seen this sort of nonsense before. Right? That is a woman's face. Right? That is a woman's face. Um, so, now let's say I show you this picture. <laughs> that is hard. It's true. That is hard. What what is that though? It's a little more abstract, but obviously it's it's a giant no. <laughs> it's a face, right? Obviously, there's eyes, just like over here. There's eyes. There's a nose. There's a mouth. You know, there's a neck, right? It's a woman's face. It's an abstract picture, but it's a woman's face. But let's say that I showed you this picture, which is a person playing a saxophone. Thank you. Excellent. Good job, everyone. Recognize one of the basic instruments. Uh, man playing saxophone. And then I showed you this picture. Still looks like a woman's face, doesn't it? Because I primed you with that one first. <laughs> But it's a saxophone player, right? Like here's his big nose, like Zach said earlier, and his lips, and there's that, there's his feet, right? It's a small man, like sort of a Engelbert Humperdinck sort of man <laughs> playing a very large saxophone, I don't know, mega sax or something, I don't know. I just made that up, I don't know. Sure, bass sax, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, mega sax. I like mega sax better. <laughs> mega sax versus Sharknado. You know, something like that. I could see that happening. Uh, but that's, that's priming in, in a nutshell, right? I show you something, and then I show you something else, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. I see what that is. Um, so that's priming. And then we have what we call patternicity. And this is our tendency, our natural tendency, our inborn tendency as humans to find meaningful patterns in meaningless stimuli, right? or to believe something's real when it's not. And we are fantastic at this because, again, our brains are pattern recognition machines. This has been an extraordinarily useful thing for us as a species to be able to respond and recognize patterns in our environment. And a very particular pattern is, again, the human face. It's a very good pattern for us to recognize and respond to. And this goes hand-in-hand in hand with what we call agenticity, which is then seeing these patterns and seeing something as causing those patterns. So what caused the weather? Right? It's not Mike Morgan. Right? He causes panic about the weather. Um, what causes the weather? Well, we did this thing, and then we got some rain. Right? We had a particular dance, or we sacrificed somebody in a volcano, and then it rained. Seemed to work, right? <laughs> like, well, what caused that? Well, the rain gods caused that. You know, that's what happened there. So we see the patterns, and then we attribute something as causing those patterns. And again, here I'm talking about ambiguous, meaningless stimuli. And this is something that we very naturally do. So when we look up in the sky and we see something like this, 
Yeah. That is a heart cloud. That is a heart cloud. It is a cloud that looks like a heart, right? But is it really a heart? Right? Like is just just a cloud. You know, Cupid's not up there like, you know what I'd like to do today? Make some heart clouds. Uh, is that cool with you, Venus? And she's like, I was fine, I'm taking a bath over here. Like, get out of here. Um, that's not what happens, right? But our cognitive biases, uh, priming in our environment, and then these tendencies that we have naturally towards patternicity, towards agenticity, all combine to make us see lots of things that are not actually even there. And this happens all the time. And the two examples that I gave earlier are great examples of this sort of thing. All right? So let's say, for example, you're a parent in the late 70s, early 80s, and you're pretty concerned about this rock and roll music. right? Those kiss people all dressed up with the kabuki masks. I don't think that's right. And you're pretty upset about that. You're worried that it's going to be influencing your children negatively because they're you know, in the room being sullen and angry and rock and rolling all night and partying every day and whatnot. They're, you know, not doing the, what you want them to be doing. And so you begin listening to these records because you've heard about this sort of thing, right? And, but they're sneaky, right? These rock musicians are real sneaky. Not generally, let's be honest, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, you're primed now. I'm primed to be hearing words about sex and drugs and Satan and things like that. And so I'm listening to these records backwards over and over again, you know, playing them backwards. What's going on there? What's going on there? <gasps> Was that tool shed? <laughs> it was. What are they doing in the tool shed? <gasps> He's making them suffer. <laughs> yes, Satan is making them suffer in the tool shed. And then the next thing you know, you know, you're, you're talking about that in front of Congress, and you know, Led Zeppelin is laughing madly, and you know, they're over in England having a drink or something, whatever that is they do. Um, and so, what your brain is doing then is it picks out these words that you're primed for from literally ambiguous sounds. Right? They're meaningless sounds, completely meaningless. But you assume then that there's some sort of pattern there and that there's some sort of agent behind said pattern right? that made the findings, that made this terrible statement, right? that's trying to influence your children negatively in society. And so you then blame the musicians. Now, what's really nice about this is this just fit into your belief that these rock and rollers are all terrible human beings who worship the devil and blah, 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 blah. And so then you accept that. You're like, yeah, of course they did. Trying to get my babies. <laughs> right? And you're trying to protect your babies. So therefore, what you want to do is you want to then get that outlawed. right? Let's, let's have some fights about that. But what's really interesting with bas back masking is how completely implausible it is. <laughs> Right? Um, so there's two questions that you have to actually answer to say, okay, are these people doing this? Right? Are they doing this? The first one is, were they purposefully inserting such messages? You know, were they doing this on purpose? Right? And we'll get to that in a second. And the second one is, could such messages have any impact on a person's behavior then? These backmasked messages. Um, no. No. That appears to be pretty clear on the first one. No. Um, most of these satanic occult messages, very clear, right? Very, very clear. You go listen to these music and you're not like, I don't know what they're trying to tell me. What is Iron Maiden trying to say here? Dio, what's his point that he's trying to make? You know, literally, they're literally telling you what the point of the song is, right? Uh, Kiss, you know, they're so subtle. You're never sure exactly what it is that they're talking about except if you listen to the lyrics, right? Um, so the first appears to be no. The answer to the second one is also no. Um, because in research on this issue, um, which is something that you know, we do as scientists, if you play speech backwards, <laughs> most people can tell if it's a male or a female speaking. But that is it. 
That's it. You can't tell actually what is being said. A lot of times you can't even tell what language it is in. Uh, and you certainly can't be like, oh, you know what? Hold on. Flip it. <gasps> Satan's tool shed. <laughs> so that's definitely not what's going on. And it's only if you're purposefully primed to hear these phrases that you're able to then detect these phrases, which is pretty funny. And so if you don't understand something, then it can't have any influence on your behavior. It's not like priming, in other words. Um, you can't really get that from these backmasked sounds. So let, me, let me give you guys a couple of examples of that. Um, so for example, many of you may be familiar with a, a chart-topping song called the Pokemon. Oh, I know we've heard it before at our house. <laughs> That's right, it's the Pokemon. Now let's play it backwards. That's right. I love Satan, I love Satan, I love Satan, I love Satan. And now you know why Pokemon has become such a worldwide evil phenomenon. All those Pokemon-inspired murderings. <laughs> yes, we've seen the children engage in. That's right. What? No. Uh, it turns out that, that literally, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, literally any song, if you play it. a rap classic. Um, literally any song, if you play it and you're listening for certain words, probably at some point during said song, you'll be able to find those words. <laughs> now, was Slim Shady uh, sneaky enough to actually insert that into there? Probably not, you know, not that he's not, you know, good with words, but again, figuring out what the reverse of words is, pretty much impossible. Maybe, maybe you're Britney Spears and trying to make someone lose their mind. This is my favorite one. So if you reverse it, what she's obviously saying is, sleep with me, I'm not too young. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what particularly self-involved individual found that one, but I'm glad that they did, right? I'm glad that they did. So, you know, whether it's, you know, Mary on toast or um, faces on Mars, these pareidolias are a great example of our biases at play and are a great example of why we can't always trust our brain. You know, the NASA or the Mars face, NASA literally in their press release with the image was like, here's why it looks like a face. Here's the <laughs> angle of the Mesa and how you know, the sun was hitting it and where our thing was. Isn't that fun? Like trying to drum up interest in the space programs. Uh, and then people were like, holy shit, it's a face on Mars. <laughs> There's probably other things too. And then pretty soon people were finding pyramids on Mars. Uh, I believe there was actually a dog that was found on Mars, like a big dog. Uh, yeah, so it's like, what? No, what? Um, it was just, literally, it's just the shadows. You know, it's just the shadows that made it appear to be a face. When they went back in 2001 uh, and released all of these nice big high-res images, this is the same Mesa. Not very facey, right? Not very facey. Of course, then it was, it's a cover-up. They're trying to hide it, right? Because people had already believed in this. Uh, and so, you know, once the, the evidence is out there, uh, it gets ignored a lot of times because these beliefs are already established. And so, you know, one thing that our brains are really, really good at is fooling us. They're good at lots of things. But one of them is fooling us, and they're really great at that. 
And we can't rid ourselves of these cognitive biases. This isn't somewhere you're like, all right, I'm going to get a new software update. You know, I'm going to go read this book, fantastic book. I'll be completely, completely non-biased. No, you're still going to have biases. But you can decrease their effects. And the first step in decreasing those actually is awareness raising, uh, knowing that these are out there and that, oh, I could fall prey to them. And then you can help see them in other people very easily at that point. And you just start pointing them out. You're like, nope, 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 bias, bias. And then people are like, we hate you now. <laughs> so that's why you have to continue reading the other chapters in the book uh, to figure out how else to think critically about your own biases, right? Uh, because, you know, being able to doubt yourself, being able to think critically, that leads you to examine your own beliefs. And that's where we really need to be. Because most of us are pretty good at pointing those out and be like, that's ridiculous. But then someone says that to you and you're like, shut your face before I punch it. Because you know? that's my belief and I got this. And so using tools like the scientific method, uh, problem solving methods in order to figure out you know, what's actually real and what's not real can really decrease the impact that those will have on you. So, thanks. I'm happy to answer questions if you have those. I know it's fairly sweltering in here because apparently they decided, lack speaking, let's turn up the heat. Uh, lots of people, not a fan. So, uh, it was probably somebody who thinks about the face on Mars and they turned it up. So, Brian. It seems like that we have a, a desire to look for these kind, to want these kind of things to exist outside of our own experience of reality. We want there to be ghosts, we want there to be aliens, we want there to be, you know, the Mars face or whatever. But we're also very extremely anxious about these things and fearful of them at the same time. And so we have, tele we have television and, and movies about uh, Armageddon and aliens taking us over. We have horror films with ghosts and all kinds of stuff. So there's like a duality, a draw and a repel to this. And my question is, do you th why do you think that is? How do you explain it? And do you think it's evolutionary or just a part of the human condition? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a great question. So, you know, basically you, we see these things, right, we're primed to see them, we, we see them in meaningless stimuli, uh, and then the, particularly the ones you're talking about, the frightening, fearful ones, we try and do something, I think, and that's what your second part of it was, try and do something to make them not so fearful, to try and put this under some control. So, well, well, if we perform these certain rituals, we can get rid of the ghosts, right? If we are aware of how the aliens might attack, then you know, maybe we can prepare for that. And so I think a lot of it is that sort of preparatory work to like, well, if I'm, I mean, if aliens come, if zombies attack, I know what to do, right? Like, I'm good, I, I, I know where the compound is, we're gonna hang out, and I, I, could, I could kill zombies, right? I've seen it happen. Um, so I think a lot of that's preparatory and trying to try and sort of decrease that own fear that you might have of this, this object, this unknown object that you're talking about. Um, and then, you know, from a personal standpoint, it's because it's fun, right? It's fun to think about these things. Um, reality is amazing, but at the same time, I primarily read science fiction and fantasy books because I don't want to just be like, oh, look, it's things that happen in real life. <laughs> Boring. Right? I want to hear about, you know, ghosts and aliens and magic and stuff like that, like it's cool. So we're sort of drawn to that as well, I think, in terms of, you know, it's, it's outside of our own experience, it's amazing, it's exciting, it helps us, you know, uh, sort of be taken somewhere else. And so believing in those sort of things, ghosts, for example, you know, um, a lot of the ghost hunters that I've talked to uh, who have not yet captured a ghost, I'm just gonna throw that out, uh, Bill Murray notwithstanding, um, <laughs> You know, I talk to them and they get a huge rush from this, right? Like they really have a lot invested in that sort of a belief. And they do a lot to support that belief. And so, you know, there's uh, something personal for them in that sort of thing, I think. Well, anyway, there you go. Thanks. 
Yeah, let's go. So I can see an evolutionary benefit of recognizing faces and making snap judgments based on those and that kind of thing, but what would be the benefit of seeing religious symbols, symbols when they're not necessarily there? Okay, good, good question. So um, what some people might say is that you know, it evolves for certain patterns. Um, this, this ability uh, to recognize patterns evolved for certain patterns. Faces, um, snakes is another really good one. Any of you who have ever been, you know, walking through the woods or the backyard or something, and it's your hose that's been there for literally a year, right? And you're freaked out every time that you see it. Uh, know what I'm talking about there. Um, some people would say that the recognition for religious symbols is sort of a spandrel of that. Uh, it's what we call sort of a byproduct, an evolutionary byproduct. It's not intended, but it's there. Um, and that it's so frequent because we're primed for it so frequently. So, you know, the vast majority of people are religious, are immersed in hearing, seeing, thinking about religious symbols very often. And so they're primed very heavily for that and their pattern recognition just sort of takes over and sees those things that they're primed for. Um, so I think that would kind of be what a lot of folks would say. So. You, you mentioned self-doubt, questioning yourself and things like that. I know regarding my own memory, I realized long ago that I recognized that I, I changed and embellished my memories and my stories that I tell <laughs> about you know, things. And, and, and so I, I, for a long time, I've kind of made a mental effort in, in you know, am I telling really the, the correct original version or is this the embellished version right. in my thinking? But I've encountered people who are like utterly confident of their memory and yes. merely, merely suggesting, even politely, that their memory might, you know, might, that might, might maybe. Be different yeah. than, than what they were remembering just made them incensed. And yes. so there are people like that. Oh, yes. Most of us, it turns out. Um, I mean, I, I would say one of the things that's often shocking to folks in our like general psychology classes, our higher level classes, when we actually talk about the research on memory and how valuable memory is and how terrible memory is in many, many regards. Uh, and we have enormous amounts of research showing that not only is memory bad and it's reconstructive, meaning we build the memories each time that we, we are recollecting them, um, but that they're also very easily changed so it's not that just what we're rebuilding them, but I can insert new memories, I can change what it is you believe. Uh, in some very clever experiments, people end up believing things happened to them that never happened to them. Um, and a lot of people have a hard time with that up front. They're just like, what? But, uh, no, but I, my life is a lie? Uh, I'm like, no, not quite, but part of it, yeah. Um, but that's okay, we won't tell other people, right? It's okay. Uh, so, but a lot of people are very, very against that. Um, and a lot of times because I mean, they just haven't been exposed to, well, here's what we actually know. <laughs> here's how we know it. And let me give you some examples. So in my classes, I'll do a lot of priming examples uh, or show false memories that people have done. Um, like insert a false memory into somebody, like a word in a list that literally wasn't there. And then half the class remembers that word. And I'm like, no, it's not there. Let's look again. And we go back and they're just like, what? What did you do to me? Are you a wizard? And I say, no, I'm a mage. Um, so I don't like the tall hats. So, um, so yeah, but lots of people do that, David. Lots of people do that. So, which can be very frustrating if you're on the other end and you're like, no, no, you're not. You're not. So. All right. Well, thank you guys again. Um, I'm going to hang out here if anybody wants to buy any of the other books. Sorry that those sold out um, already. If you, I go print a few off. I'm sure the department would love that. Uh, get the paper reams out. So, um, so I'll be out there. Uh, if anybody wants a shirt, they're very, very cheap and high quality. <laughs> Keita's modeling one currently. So. Um, and I'll be there. So thank you all again. Yeah.